We have been condemned justly. Have we? Since the beginning of the church, there have been those who keep coming back to the same error, the same mistake. This idea that our condemnation isn't really just. Damnation can't really be true. There are a lot of subtle and clever arguments to support the idea that everyone goes to heaven. We call that universalism. But it seems to me there's always something beneath the surface, a rejection of the justice behind such condemnation. Most people who defend universalism or claim that hell is empty will point to God's mercy and claim that their belief in God's mercy is so great that they just can't believe he'd condemn anyone. But that is a false mercy. It's a horrific insult to human freedom given by God. Even worse, it's an insult to God, a rejection of what we celebrate today, what we see depicted in the gospel. Jesus Christ is king of the universe. It is why we rejoice today, why I wear gold, why we're singing a little more, why we go into the streets to lift him up and acknowledge his rightful claim to all that we have, all that we are, all that there is. What makes Jesus Christ the king? St. Paul tells us in this ancient hymn, probably sung by the first Christians, he is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation, for in him were created all things in heaven and on earth. As the Son of God, Jesus is God and creator, and so has all the power of a king and much more. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. A king comes first like the point of an arrow. He signifies the unity of his people, acting as a single figure to connect and direct a multitude. Jesus is the unifier of the church since his sacrificial self-gift on the cross unites us to his very body, the same body which is the place of union between humanity and divinity. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he himself might be preeminent. By entering into death and rising from it, Jesus manifested his power not only over the first creation, but over the recreation, the resurrection promised to us. So he's king of this life, as well as king of the life to come. For in him all the fullness was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things for him, making peace by the blood of his cross through him, whether those on earth or those in heaven. The fullness of God's infinite splendor and goodness is what created us. By sin, we reject that infinite goodness, incurring a debt we cannot pay back. Sin, in a very real sense, rejects the very source of our own existence. That is why the heresy of universalism is so offensive. Jesus, the God-man, died on the cross to reconcile heaven and earth. But think about what it means to reconcile people to each other. Since a person has free will, reconciliation is only possible if they themselves choose it. God, for his part, has willed, chosen to reconcile with us. That's why he sent his son, who freely chose to die on the cross, as proof of his offer of reconciliation. This proclamation of God's kingdom by Jesus, for all of its diverse expression, can be summed up in this short scene on the cross. The criminal who rejects and ridicules Jesus versus the one who pleads for mercy. The one who ignores the justice of his own condemnation versus the one who accepts it and pleads for mercy. We can be one or the other. In God, mercy and justice are not in conflict. A good king does not ignore justice. No, Jesus reconciles us to God by meeting justice out of his own goodness and love. God does not leave spiritual debts unpaid. 
wounds unhealed. What he does is pull from his own infinite love to pay our debts and heal our wounds on our behalf. God's mercy is the fulfillment of justice, not its rejection. But once given, there is something this reconciliation requires from us, our acceptance. Jesus promises the repentant criminal that he will be in paradise. But he says nothing to the one who rejects him. He does not say, I will bring you to paradise against your will. God, who created us to be free, is a sign of his great kingship, respects our freedom. And if he gives us freedom to reject him, but then forces us to be with him in heaven anyway, then we're not truly free. A king who forces people into his kingdom against their will is no longer a king, but a tyrant, a kidnapper, a slaver. By sin, we are under the power of the kingdom of darkness, and only by grace are we transferred to the kingdom of God's beloved Son. The ability to accept grace also means the ability to reject it, meaning that it is not only possible, but in fact likely that people will reject it. And for those who reject grace, being forced to stay near God's glory in heaven would be even worse than hell. Understanding and accepting this can be hard. If we approach this mystery with presumption, if we think we deserve heaven simply because we exist, then the Lord seems unjust as a king. But that error is evidence we don't understand sin. And we don't understand sin because we don't understand the glory of the king against whom we sin. Your every heartbeat is a pure gift from God. The majesty of his splendor is shown in our undeserved and continued existence. The undeserved offer of his mercy, the undeserved patience that he shows by extending that offer of mercy up to the very moment of death. Do not insult the king by taking his goodness for granted. Do not insult him by denying the freedom he gives us or claiming him to be a tyrant. Honor your king by turning from sin. Honor him by accepting his mercy. Honor him by giving him what he wants most of all, to have you with him in paradise. We have been condemned justly. I am not saying God's condemnation is proof of his glory. I am saying that once we understand how glorious our king is, we will understand how grave even the smallest of sin is, and therefore understand how just is our condemnation. And yet all of that is but a preparation, a precursor, to seeing the even more luminous revelation of his kingship. Despite all of the justice of the condemnation, despite the infinite difference between God's goodness and our sinfulness, despite owing us nothing, this glorious king, if we accept his justice, we can, through baptism, confession, and all the sacraments, say to him, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he will.